Um, with that, I'm gonna turn this over briefly to Dennis Kenya, our president last year, who has a, some educational announcements he wants to share. Hi, thank you, Steve, and hello, everyone. Great to see uh, a great number of uh, participants today. This is, uh, we're really hitting it out of the ballpark today. We're up to 112 participants. That's, that's really great. And so um, along those lines, as long as we've got the attention of so many people, I wanted to announce a few um, activities that are coming up, uh, kind of educational opportunities. And so the first one that I wanted to mention is that with uh, Kane County Audubon, uh, their monthly meeting will be next Wednesday on April 14th. And the speaker is going to be talking about, um, it's kind of a, a spring warbler tune-up. And so uh, there'll be this discussion on um, visual cues for identifying all the warblers. And it'll actually be uh, the first opportunity for the rollout of seeing warblers from below, which is something we're going to be focusing on in our uh, mini tutorial education channel on YouTube uh, in May. There's going to be two programs that come out uh, all about identifying warblers from just seeing them from below. So I think that'll be interesting. Uh, I also wanted to mention that the Morton Arboretum has a lot of educational opportunities and a couple of them are classes that I'm doing. Uh, I have my uh, seasonal field study class, which is uh, five Sundays. Now, that one's going to run from May 2nd till May 30th. And uh, those, that's entirely a field class. So you're outside birding all the time. And it's a great way to get uh, a good foundation for your, um, for your birding skills. There's also a spring warbler workshop uh, that's going to involve a Thursday evening lecture on May 6th from 6.30 to 8.30. And then two Saturdays following that where we'll be doing field work and that'll be on May 8th and May 22nd. And in addition to that, uh, the Arboretum also offers uh, bird walks on several Saturdays throughout the season. And they are going to have, uh, and those run from eight o'clock till 10.30. And those are on April 18th, May 16th, and June 20th. And then finally, uh, DuPage Forest Preserve also has some educational uh, birding opportunities. They do some bird walks as well. And they're going to do one um, at Denada Forest Preserve on April 9th, and that's a Friday, from 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning. Herrick Lake uh, on April 16th, also a Friday, same time. Uh, West DuPage Woods, on May 1st, which is a Saturday, and that one is from 8.30 to 9.30. I'm guessing that might be a misprint because um, I can't believe they're getting you out there just for one hour. And then West DuPage Woods once again, and that's on May 7th, and that's also a Friday, and that's 7.30 to 9.30. So there's a lot of opportunities to get out there, and, and aside from our own personal or our own field trips, we have many field trips in April, and I think May is going to have even more. I haven't talked to the uh, field trip chairs, but I do believe that we're coming up with quite a slate of activities for, for May. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities to get out there, improve your brain skills, no matter what you're starting at. And Please ask hosts. And I invite everyone to come on out. All right. You all set, Dennis? Thank you. I should have told everyone to grab a pencil and paper on that one, but... Um, <laughs> This, the recording of this will show up, and if you do look at the Forest Preserve District of DuPage and the ARB, and um, you'll you'll see listings for those trips. So, um, thank you, Dennis. With that, I'm going to turn this over to. Well, we have two big birding opportunities to talk about um, before our presentation. The first of which is going to be from our own Joe Suchecki who's gonna talk about the spring bird count, which is coming up in about a month. In a month? In a month, I think. So, um, Joe, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, Joe's Thank gonna speak. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay. I'm looking forward to this. So I, I uh, thanks uh, Steve and Adley for giving me some time to talk about the spring bird count in DuPage County. Uh, it's coming up on Saturday, uh, May 8th. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, the annual spring bird count is a great tradition here in Illinois. 
uh, that started back in 1972. Uh, and almost all the counties throughout the state participated in it. There were a few, a few counties, kind of some of the rural southern counties that uh, you know don't, don't have many birders and sometimes they're uh, you know they would have folks do the count. But uh, Illinois DNR tries to get uh, the whole state covered. And it's information that they use that provides some indications of uh, bird migration and also trends. Uh, it's held on the first Saturday after May 3rd. And it's, the date is kind of a compromise so that uh, uh, with, with that stipulation that should be good for both Southern Illinois and uh, Northern Illinois. Um, and it's similar to a Christmas count if you've been on one of those where instead of just going out and recording species, you actually go out and count all the birds observed uh, over a 24 hour period. It's different from the Christmas count in that there aren't any circles like the Fermi circle or Arboretum circle. It's, it's a coverage is, is by county wide. Um, the first one was held in 1972. Uh, DuPage County started their count in 1973. Uh, so we have 48 years of continuous coverage for the page. And over that time period, on the spring count, 260 species have been recorded in the county. And our all-time high number of species was 183 in one day in 2004. Last year, um, we had 155 species. Uh, it's also of note that we had, had 107 participants were generally the highest or you know, close to the highest number of people who participate. And I'd like to keep that record going. So if everyone on the video tonight, on the meeting tonight, signs up, we'll be in good shape. Um, and then last year, we, you know, while we had um, kind of an average number of participants, we actually recorded the highest number of party hours ever in the field. Uh, and of course, last year, we had a number of uh, issues with the pandemic. We weren't allowed to get into Fermi Lab or the Arboretum, and we had kind of constraints on uh, how we were to conduct it. So uh, how we do this is each uh, the county is divided into 16 areas, and that's in these traditional areas that have been set up for a long time. And then uh, there's an area captain for each one. And then the area captain coordinates how people who are uh, you know, going to go out and count in that area, uh, you know, covers covers the field, and then also they, you know, people submit their uh, results to the area captain. This is a map just to show you of the sixteen different areas. Um, so, kind of, you know, this will be available as as uh, Steve said on the recording. Uh, but just kind of kind of look at how how it is available. So uh, this year uh, we'll, we'll still have a couple of restrictions in place with COVID, but it's certainly not going to be as restrictive as it was last year. And it's we're, we're basing it uh, to have similar restrictions as on a DuPage Birding Club field trip. Um, uh, this year uh, we're going to allow groups of people to get together, uh, up to fifteen people. Um, we're going to ask everyone to wear masks if you're birding in a group. And uh, there's still no carpooling unless you're uh, in your carpooling with your bubble, your immediate family and friends who, who you know are good. And uh, the organizations, as I said, in assignments will be up to the area captains. And I know the Arboretum will be open for people to sign up. And I, I believe that Fermilab is going to be restricted Again, if at all, um, so we're not going to have a lot of people at Fermi Lab. So the good news is, if you participated before in previous spring counts, you don't need to do anything. Um, I plan on sending out information to all of you in in, in the areas and the captain in another week or so. So um, if you have participated before, you're already signed up, and you should expect a, a uh, email from me and then a contact from the area captain about the count. Um, if you have not participated and would like to, 
uh, just send me an email indicating your interest. And I've got the, my the email address that I'm using for this up here. And that contact information is also on the website and in Drummings. So uh, we'll find a place for you to participate. And you know, uh, this is a count where uh, your, your skill level is not critical. We want everybody to get out and have some fun. And so if you're a beginner, um, you know, you're, you're welcome to participate and we'll, maybe we'll pair you with a more experienced birder sometime, but it's, it's always lots of fun. So thanks a lot and uh, hope to see everybody on the spring count. Hey, that's it, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And that's a bird I've seen on a spring count before. And when I started these a while back, I was a not particularly good spring birder. Um, but going out with seasoned veterans like Linda Padera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I got to know them a bit better. And um, it is great to have extra pairs of eyes, even if they're not the most expert ideas out there. If people are recording uh, what's being seen. That's also a very helpful thing to do, even if you're not a, the most seasoned birder. So I encourage everyone to give it a try. Um, and it is May 8th. Um, and because spring is just a fount of birding and bird excitement, we have another little announcement presentation from uh, Bob Fisher tonight, um, who's gonna talk about the Bird Conservation Network, um, which I also have been involved with. And so he's gonna show his little, do his presentation here with Natalie's assistance. And you know, by the time 7.30 or so rolls around, we will, get to our main speaker of the evening to just uh, get everyone even more excited about birding in DuPage this spring. So are you there, Bob? And Natalie? I'm ready. Uh, are you ready, Natalie? Uh, sure. All right. I'm going to share. Put up the... Um... Oh, where'd it go? <laughs> Here it is. I meant to have that all ready. <laughs> I posted uh, the... Um the uh, email, not email, but the uh, web address for the Bird Conservation Network, if you don't know what it is. It's a group of about uh, 20 or so different organizations interested, uh, of course, in bird conservation. The DuPage Birding Club is, uh, in a sense, a charter member. The BCN has been in existence for a bit over 20 years now, and one of its main goals uh, has been to uh, if you will, census or uh, take a look at the uh, the uh, 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 trends in terms of you go to the next one if you would. Oh. We we have BCN has 22 years of uh, monitoring data on the birds that breed here in the Chicago region, and I'll show you a definition of that a little later. Uh, it's a huge database um, in aggregate uh, about over 470,000 birds are in the database and there are 190 or more breeding species here in the Chicago region to give you some idea of the birding biodiversity, shall we say. Um, the, uh, the counts themselves, including uh, DuPage, there are over 2,300 points. This is called a point count, where you set up a, uh, a spot uh, within a habitat and you count the birds that you see and hear for a certain period of time. I won't get into the detailed logistics, but it's, it's done during the breeding season. And uh, over the history of the BCN census, there there are uh, over 2,300 point counts at, at uh, almost 300 different sites through what we refer to generically at, as the Chicago Wilderness Region. Uh, that's, those counts have been conducted by more than 250 people. Uh, the, the total hours is over 18,000. That's nine man years. Mm -hmm. And if you factor in travel time, which is an issue, at times for some people, uh, the, the uh, travel time is uh, 
considerable, as you can see. Next one, Ned. The, the numbers in the, uh, the BCN database include the breeding bird data gathered here in DuPage County. And in fact, uh, DuPage began uh, bird monitoring even a little bit more this region-wide, uh, a little bit before this region-wide monitoring program began. Uh, it began officially in 97, although monitoring was conducted even back into the 70s. Uh, the, the data compiled here in DuPage uh, represents almost a quarter of all of the data that's contained in the uh, BCN database. So we are our very important component. Next one, Matt. Um, why count and why record the data? By the way, all the data is recorded and retained uh, in eBird. Fundamentally, um, the data is then used to analyze population trends for the birds that breed in within the Chicago or Chicago wilderness region. And uh, later this year, uh, BCN is going to publish uh, population trends data extending from um, 1999 through uh, last year's uh, data. So uh, 22 years worth of data. Go ahead, Natalie. What do we do with that data once we have it? Uh, one of BCN's major projects is to produce information which I'll essentially call a list of birds of concern. And that list identifies spe species that for one reason or another are showing a, a tendency to decline in our region or maybe they're declining uh, uh, across a bigger region or nationally, or in some cases, they might be increasing in our region, but declining elsewhere. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. So the birds of concern, this brochure is from, I believe, 2013. So this is uh, essentially seven or eight years of additional data, which will be used to produce uh, the 2020 version. And how do we use that to go on to the next? It's used to encourage landowners, land managers, site stewards. For example, Joe, uh, Joe Sacecki is a site steward at, uh, at uh, Springbrook. It's used to um, evaluate the, the habitat, how the birds are doing, and what can be done to enhance the breeding habitat uh, for those uh, bird species that breed here in the Chicago region. Uh, one very good example is um, uh, the expansion of uh, native woodland understory planting uh, because there, we have a number of ground nesting uh, birds that uh, without that understory, they suffer from nest predation. Uh, including, surprisingly, by deer, which we, of course, have awful, also have an overabundant population here in DuPage. So uh, wood thrushes, oven birds are a couple of the species that are affected. So rebuilding the understory, uh, the land managers can use the bird data to determine where and how to do that most effectively. Go ahead. I don't know how many people know this, but within the nominally the sixth county area, it includes a little bit of Indiana, a little bit of uh, far southeastern Wisconsin, but it's mostly Illinois. There are, there's a network of over a half million acres of, of natural areas, um, 850 square miles. And of course, we sit right in the middle of one of uh, the U.S.'s largest metropolitan areas. So it's a rather amazing uh, juxtaposition of natural areas with a huge uh, population. 
And I might add, our area is also noted as a really important uh, migration corridor for a lot of birds that don't breed here, but keep going north. But that's a, a subject for another story. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Just to give you an idea of how comprehensive the coverage is, um, there's a program called the North American Breeding Bird Survey. Uh, they conduct 3,200 routes, and uh, each route is counts at 50 points. So each year they count at 160,000 points ac across those uh, 3,200 routes. If you scale up the uh, density of our coverage, the uh, breeding bird survey would have to do 10 times as many routes to accomplish uh, the coverage density that we do with the Bird Conservation Network uh, uh, breeding bird monitoring. Go ahead, Ned. For people who are listening to this, if you'd like to become a monitor, here are the, the uh, there are eight sites right at the moment that um, monitors are needed. About, all but one of them are in the uh, western half of the county. Uh, the skill you need, probably most importantly, is the ability to identify uh, the breeding birds that inhabit specific habitat types by ear. So if, you're, if your site is in the middle of a, uh, a grassland, you're going to need to know the uh, the songs and call, calls of the breeding birds that use that grassland. Uh, you have to make anywhere from four to six uh, visits nominally starting at sunrise. And typically there are several points involved. So you'll end, you'll probably end at, uh, if you start at sunrise, you'll end at 8 or 8.30. Um, and in order to qualify, the DuPage County Forest Reserves has a fairly rigorous um, protocol to qualify here in DuPage. And uh, you have to fill out a, an application packet. Uh, you have to sign a waiver. Uh, they do a background check on you. And then they essentially approve you for monitoring. Go ahead to the next net. This didn't come out very well, but this local shows locally where the eight sites are uh, within DuPage County right now. Fisher Woods on the east and all the other ones are on the western side of the county. And by the way, there uh, you'll be able to access a list and some more background information uh, that'll be available. Go ahead to the next one there. This is just a sample of the, um, the uh, volunteer job description that DuPage County uses, the Forest Preserve District. That's one of the documents that'll be available to you so you can look it over. Go ahead and go on. So if you're interested, um, you can simply email dbcbirds at aol.com and you'll get a one page fact sheet which will give you uh, links to much of what you've seen here, how to, how to uh, if you will, sign up. And it'll also include links so you can look at some of these individual sites on the Forest Preserve District website so you can get an idea of the type of habitat that you would be covering. And I emphasize that it, it, it isn't really a beginner's activity, but we do offer training uh, and uh, uh, mentors and uh, uh, it's something that sometimes you can start out with somebody, and then as your skill level increases, particularly in birding by ear, you can uh, uh, get out there on your own. And by the way, it's done through the entire Chicago wilderness region. I mentioned that earlier. So it's, uh, it's other than getting up really early in the morning, it's a fun, uh, a fun thing to do. So I encourage you, if you have an interest, to... Uh, uh, drop drop an email to that address, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get you started on the sign up process. How am I doing on time, uh, Steve? 
Well, we you got a minute or two. We need okay, to wrap it up. I'll go on to the next one. We'll run to the next ones very quickly. This is some of the uh, the uh, historical data. Uh, I'll just run. This is a grassland bird that nationally is decreasing in in uh, population, but locally, due to places like Springbrook, the Henslow sparrows are actually increasing. So we are doing some things right. Go to the next one. Conversely, for reasons that may not be obvious to us, but there, there's surely a reason, sedrins, which also op operate uh, uh, in grasses, uh, wet sedge meadows and so forth, are declining in the region. Next one. Blue, blue gray gnat catchers in woodlands are increasing. That may not be anything that we're doing in woodlands. That may reflect the fact that that species is reoccupying some of its uh, historical territory. Uh, Joe could tell you a little more about that related to the breeding bird, uh, the uh, spring bird count. And the next one, um, war warbling vireos, a shrubland bird, again, apparently a population decline. Reasons at this point unknown. Next, rose-breasted grosbeaks. They are doing well. We must be doing something right in our woodlands and our denser shrublands because they seem to be increasing. Whereas the next species, one of our favorite songsters, wood thrushes are declining. And that may be what I referred to earlier as the, uh, as the effect of um, uh, lack of understory. On to the last couple. Rough wing swallows in marshes and are doing quite well. Um, we all know tree swallows use uh, um, bluebird nests, so they're doing pretty well as, as well. But this is kind of an interesting species. You can see how their population jumps around, but it's been steadily increasing. And the last one, I think, in this sequence, Swamp sparrow, again, is showing a tendency to decline in our wetlands and marshes. And it may be weather related. That's speculation on my part. Uh, but the next data set will tell us more because they're relating this to weather during the breeding season. Those years where you see a population spike might represent wetter years and where there's been a drop off that might represent drier years. So that's just to give you an idea of how the data is used and why it's important to keep doing it. Go on to the last, I think. Yeah, we don't know enough about our marsh and let, wetland birds and some of the less common breeding species. Uh, the more data we collect, the better we'll understand how they're doing. And on to the last one. So BCN and the bobolinks and all the other 190 breeding species, we want to thank the people that have monitored and we want to encourage all of you who are interested in monitoring to sign up and join the effort. It's a great way to, to get involved in birding and provide some really important data. I think I'm done. Yep. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bob. I look forward to seeing what the data for the last decade or so does with those trends and what our new birds, if we have new birds of concern or some that are you know, taken off the list. There's a lot to look forward to when the data is finally processed and we'll try to have BCN back to talk about that. Um, there is a question in the chat for you, Bob, if you want to look at that. I think it's about like margin of error on the orange trend. Yeah, I'll answer it right now. The, the vertical bars are just to break up. The, uh, they represent uh, I think a two year intervals. Okay. Um, all right, Natalie, I'm gonna leave it to you and John now. We can get our main presentation underway here. Thank you everyone for, um, you know, all Steve, this. Steve, I would like to make one comment. Oh, okay. Just, just to make sure it's clear. You know, I did send out in the chat that you have to register for those forest preserve field or bird walks. And so the place to do that is through the forest preserve districts website. 
and they do cost $5. So just in case people missed that information in the chat, I just wanted to make sure that they all got that. Okay, yeah, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, like, just like the Arboretum too, you have to register on their site and- Right. Stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was quite a tour de force of DuPage birding excitement and we got even more somehow for you now. So I'll leave it to Natalie and John. Okay, so tonight we have John um, Sabula speaking. And John is an educator, writer, naturalist, and longtime DuPage Birding Club member. As a member, he's had, headed up the outreach committee, led many field trips, and prevented, uh, bleh, presented many programs on a variety of birding topics. Um, tonight, John will be talking about the great spring birding opportunities we have here in DuPage County. So John, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'll mute myself then. <laughs> well, it's a real honor to be talking to my own people. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little context for this uh, because it's Coles to Newcastle and listening to Dennis and Joe and Bob, uh, quite frankly, they've talked on some topics that I was gonna bring up. So. You see the great minds think alike, or I guess imitation is the highest form of flattery. So let's give, let me give you the genesis for this program. I was asked probably in February by uh, the Woodridge Public Library to do a follow-up program on birding that uh, I had done one in the fall and it was well received. And I was asked very specifically to do one on spring birding. And I, I was hesitant for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I was in Florida at the time and the majority of my photographs uh, that I would have liked to have used were quite frankly on computers up here in uh, Glen Ellen, not where we were in Florida. So I was a little bit hesitant. And then I realized that, well, Last year, I set myself the challenge of photographing 100 species of birds. Thanks to DuPage County, I was easily able to complete that. In fact, uh, I think I have 130 some, 137 birds that I ended up photographing. Don't you know though, that I was still in Florida when I was supposed to give the program for the library. And in the meantime, Natalie had contacted me and asked me to kind of do the same program make it you know, a little more bird club friendly uh, for the club. Well, the, the uh, library program was gonna be my warm up. The day we were supposed to do it, the entire region that I'm in, in uh, Northern Naples, lost internet and television and we lost it for about 14 hours. So when I tried to do the birding program using my wife's cell phone as a hotspot, the bandwidth wasn't enough. Long story short, the birding club is going to be my uh, trial run. And I think in a week or two, I'm doing it for the library. So, but I had some questions when I began. Was I going to talk about the birds that I see in the morning when I'm having a cup of coffee and looking at the lanai, out my lanai at the lake that's about 15 or 20 feet from the window? You know, I see birds like the little blue heron here with the crayfish all the time. And I thought, no, I didn't want to do that. What about what I see when I go to the beach? You know, there's at least five species in this photograph. And I thought, no, that's, that's probably not appropriate. But what about the birds I see when I go shopping at Costco? This was in the parking lot at my Costco. Uh, no, that's really not relevant to Woodridge or maybe even to DuPage. And certainly the birds, and this is from my secret spot where you don't have to pay an arm and a leg to get in. I really object to any site where I have to pay to get in to watch birds. And I, yeah, I, I altered this photograph, but this is a great tourist bird. And I've had people come and tell me, oh, they're going to this Audubon site or this wildlife refuge to see the spoonbill and not see it. And I've got a spot where I always see it and it's free. So that, no, I don't want to do that. What I thought I'd do is talk about the birds I saw last spring into summer as I tried to complete my list. 
birds like the sandhill crane or birds I saw underneath my feeder. Now this I had to take through my basement window, but the Eastern towhee. So I thought, I'm gonna do that. So what I'm gonna to try to do tonight is, you know, combine a couple of programs. I'm gonna be talking about birds I saw with my 100 species challenge. I'm gonna be talking about some sites that I like going to, and I'm going to encourage people because I really truly believe this is true. Bob was talking about all the wilderness we have here in our metropolitan area. I am firmly convinced that our birding, a lot of people underappreciate the opportunities we have in Northeastern Illinois and specifically DuPage County. I can visit more diverse kinds of habitats and see more species of birds here in DuPage County than I've ever been able to accomplish in uh, Southwest Florida along the Gulf Coast. And that includes going to places like Bing Darling and the Audubon Sanctuary and all the places that uh, get a lot of publicity. And I'm gonna be talking about places in DuPage County. Some don't get a lot of publicity, others are very well known. Now remember that initially I'm gonna be, I was presenting this to people who are new to birding. So I'm gonna, re I'm gonna remind them why spring? Birds are migrating. You know, starting by the middle of February, you can start seeing birds. In fact, there are plenty of species, diving ducks, for example, and I'm hoping not, but possibly sandhill cranes that I usually see if I'm here in February, early March. I'm gonna point out that the first two weeks of May are a high point. And as Joe points out, that's when we have our spring bird count. Yeah, one of the reasons is if you wanna see a, a variety of birds, that's a great time to go. Uh, reminding them that by the middle of June, we're kind of entering the summer season and then the migration begins shortly thereafter. Birds in the spring are in their breeding plumage. You know, they look like the book and generally the weather's going to be conducive. But I also like to remind people of this, birds have wings and they don't read books, which means a bird can show up anywhere. Um, I'm of the opinion that birders make a birding hotspot almost as much as birds. If a spot is bird, birded by a lot of people, you're gonna see a larger variety of birds than a spot that doesn't get very many uh, visitors. I'm gonna remind people of some basics, that the forest preserves are all good, and that at our birding club website, under uh, we have a site where you can go and read about particular sites that many of us really appreciate. Something that was brought out, uh, I think Bob brought it up, that you wanna to go to areas of mixed habitat. You know, I gotta be honest, uh, in Florida, a lot of the preserved areas were areas the developers didn't want. So it's marshy mangrove uh, type habitat. Uh, my wife who is not a birder has gone out with me many times and even she's noticed that we can go into an area and not hear or see a bird even in a preserve. I'm going to remind people to get out as early in the day as possible. Dusk is also a good time, dress for the weather. I saw someone uh, in chat was talking about binoculars, reminding people that you don't want big high powerful binoculars, especially if you're going to be uh, doing the kind of birding we do most often in DuPage County. 735s, 842s are good sizes. I'm a big believer in field guides, not apps on my phone, especially for beginners, because you can see a variety of birds. You can take your time. Bob's been talking about the data. Boy, I, I'm really a big believer in that. So I'm going to remind people to take a notebook, write down what they see, write down the numbers of what they see take water and a snack. And I didn't realize this till Bob Spitzer and I were coordinating field trips, but there are some people who are hesitant, let's say, about going into the forest preserves. The page forest preserves are incredibly safe if you're concerned about being a crime victim, but still it's always a good idea to let someone know where you're going, what, what, uh, when you intend to be done. And uh, having spoken to forest preserve police, it's a very good idea to remember to lock your car. 
DuPage County has incredible number of forest preserves. And if you go to their website, you can click on them and get maps and read about them. Um, it'd be a challenge, I think, to give yourself a two or three year period and promise yourself you're gonna to try to visit each preserve at least once. Certain areas of the county are heavily birded. Other areas, from what I can tell from our bird club members and from when we try to run field trips in those areas, probably are less well covered. And I'm thinking particularly of the Northeastern area, say from North Avenue North and from uh, 365 East. Well, my birding, when I got back from Florida last year at uh, end of March, a bird that I really miss in Florida is the dark-eyed junco. So I'm gonna tell the beginners that this is a bird they can look out for. And this, this was, you know, I went in my backyard and saw it. And I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with juncos or eventually we will be, but they're a wonderful little bird. And ironically, they're called snowbirds. They breed up around the Hudson area, Hudson Bay area and come down here to spend the winter. In Florida, people who come down in say October and leave in March, early April are referred to as snowbirds too. Uh, also from my yard here in Glen Ellen, and I gotta tell you, some of you know this, I can walk from my house to the church where we have met, you know, I looked up one day and there were the sandhill cranes migrating overhead. That's always nice to see. And I don't overlook the house sparrows. In fact, where I am in Florida, you almost never see a house sparrow except in a parking lot. And these are good birds to, uh, to encourage beginners to get to know because they're a good basis of comparison with other birds. So, one of my areas that I really, really like is very close to me. It's just south of Roosevelt Road in Glen Ellen. It's Lambert Lake Nature Preserve. The last few years, there's been volunteer groups doing some work there. But for many years, this was essentially a detention, water detention area. And uh, I pretty much had it to myself for many years. The Page County is filled with places like this. I used to teach. Uh, not far from Springbrook Prairie for the College of DuPage. And I think I counted 50 some detention ponds on the route I took. And each one of them during migration attracts a variety of shorebirds, waterfowl. And, you know, they're not, they're worth looking at. And if there's one by your house, uh, I'd encourage you to go out, spend some time, visit at different times of the day, uh, over a period of time, and I think you'll be surprised at what you see. Well, it was one of the first places I went to when I got back last spring. And of course I saw the mallards, which is a duck that does not occur in my part of Florida. We have the model duck down there, which looks rather like a female mallard. And of course, American robins, another bird that where I am in Florida, People get very excited about seeing robins. They almost never show up that along the Gulf where I, uh, where I spend some time. And red-winged blackbird, which to me is the one true sign of spring. And it's funny, I've never seen a red-winged blackbird where I am in Florida, but if I go about an hour or so up the coast to Sarasota, there are huge flocks of them. So that's the difference a few miles can make. And grackles. Now this is very common bird where I am in Florida. Uh, here, of course, um, it's a, a spring, summer, fall bird. I was told once upon a time when I was thinking of opening a wild bird food store uh, where I am in Florida, not to bother because grackles would be about the only bird I would get at the you know, feeders and people just aren't interested in feeding birds. Of course, this is a great bird, uh, the great egret, which is one of our more common heron species, long-legged waders up here. Where I am in Florida, um, they're rather unusual. I have to go inland to see them. They're not found along the coast. And a bird that I really like seeing up here, and all these birds were at Lambert Lake, is the great blue heron, which again is very common here. 
but where I am in Florida, not so much. Of course, sometimes there's the all white variety and that uh, I have yet to see one or I've yet to see an all white large heron that I would definitely call the white form of the great blue. <clears throat> Swainson's thrush uh, showed up, well, actually shows up every year at Lambert Lake and it's a good bird, I think, to introduce beginners to because it's you know, very typical of thrushes and you can point out the field marks on it. But uh, usually they're very shy and I was happy that this one paused long enough for me to take a somewhat recognizable photograph of it. Of course, the white-throated sparrow uh, practically landed at my feet and I like showing that to beginners. And we were talking about rough wing swallows. Well, there was quite a few rough wing swallows at uh, Lambert Lake this spring and early summer, yeah, like this one. And again, it's, it's a good opportunity to talk to beginners about swallows and introduce them to the group. Now, I usually don't go chasing after birds or hunting birds, uh, but Bonnie Graham posted some photographs one day about a couple birds she saw at West Branch Forest Preserve. I've been to West Branch once or twice before I, uh, I saw those photographs over the years. Uh, the larger lake is a great place to look for diving ducks in the winter, but I decided, well, take my chances and go to West Branch. It's up on Army Trail Road. Uh, some places say it's West Chicago. Some places say it's Carroll Stream. Uh, I think one place said it's in Bloomingdale, but you can see it's right along uh, Army Trail Road, just a little west of County Farm Road. And the first bird I saw was a bird that was very common when I was a boy in Minnesota, and that was the common loon. And I was glad to see it and I'll be able to photograph it enough so that when I blew the picture up, it actually looked, excuse me, looked like a common loon. But then I quickly found the birds I came looking for, horned grebes and eared grebes, and, uh, one of each, and they were uh, shy as grebes tend to be, but uh, with patience, I was able to uh, track them down, take some photographs. Along the way, this familiar little bird, the song sparrow, Oddly enough, where I am in Florida, there are very few land birds, perching birds. And uh, so I was happy to reacquaint myself with this little guy. But then I looked at my feet, seriously, and there was a savanna sparrow, uh, a beautiful, I think a kind of a cool little sparrow and point out some of the similarities between it and the song sparrow to the beginners. But uh, I think the greatest film mark for me, the one I look for, and I know it's not always present, is that kind of yellow eyebrow. <clears throat> the east side of um, the, the forest preserve was mostly grassland, but when I went around the lake, there was a woodland and there were ruby crowned kinglets in there, lots of them. And I also saw the golden crowned kinglet. Uh, again, I was just real happy that because it was migration, perhaps they weren't quite as shy as I've usually, I usually find them. They still don't quite pose as well as I'd like, but then again, I had three, we raised three children and they never sat still for pictures either. So I was sort of prepared for that. And then one of my favorite birds, the tree swallow and, uh, We've already pointed out, you find them in bluebird boxes and they're probably one of the most common swallows in DuPage County. But it was very easy birding West Branch because there's a trail, there weren't too many bicycles or dog walkers. And uh, I, really, I really enjoyed reacquainting myself with what it was like. Well, here's a spot that's certainly not an underbirded area. Uh, but boy, if you're talking to beginners, uh, I'd really emphasize 
the treasures that you can find at Elson's Hill and Wind, Woodfield, Winfield rather. Uh, during migration, it's, it's very diverse habitat. And during migration, you can start seeing things like the rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, spring, I didn't mention it earlier, but I'll mention it when I talk to the library next week. A nice thing about spring is if it's not too far advanced, the leaves aren't out on trees and you can still get a fairly good view of the birds. And scarlet tanager. Now, to be honest, this scarlet tanager is not a spring bird and I did not photograph it at uh, uh, Els Elson's Hill. Rather, this was photographed last September at Lambert Lake. But I wanted to point, point out that, you know, this is the male during the fall, and this is what you see in the spring if you go to Elson's Hill, which for me has been the most dependable site for seeing scarlet canagers in the county. And of course, brown creepers and the white-breasted nuthatch. But for most of us, Elson's Hill is uh, the spot to go for warblers. And it's probably one of the best places in the region. Right about now, you'll start seeing palm warblers. Maybe they've even passed out of the area. Uh, they spend the winter where I am in Florida. In fact, I often have them uh, fly up on the screen of my lanai and peck insects off. And they're very, they're very approachable down there. Um, I've had one almost fly into the lanai when I was walking out, but uh, they're an early spring warbler. And of course, the yellow rumped warbler. And I like to show beginners this one to show them why it's called the yellow rumped warbler. And black and white warblers. I mean, I, I have lost count of the number of warblers I've seen, kinds of warblers I've seen, and the kinds of warblers seen at Elson's Hill. If you're a beginning birder and you want to see warblers, definitely make plan to go to Elson's Hill in the next few weeks. Common yellow throat. <clears throat> um, I can't quite see it here. The big area, if you see where Crest Creek is on this map, a big part of this area is Fermilab and it's closed to the public. But there's two spots, three spots here I'd like to point out to people. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see Pioneer Park in West Chicago. That's a really a nice park, but I was asked to survey birds there by a young man, Tristram Schrammer, who was hired by the uh, West Chicago Park District to survey its natural areas. And uh, I saw a fair number of species there a year or two ago. And it's a very civilized place to bird. On my screen, I have names covering it up, but in the kind of the lower right-hand side, there's a park called Crest Creek Park. And it's literally across the railroad tracks from Fermilab. It's mixed habitat, but a lot of open grassland. It's a great place for Dixisle, Bobolink, uh, Eastern Meadowlark, uh, several kinds of sparrows. I was amazed at the variety of birds there. And it was a place I had not gone, uh, I would not have gone to, I would not have think of going to, except I was asked to go there. Now, if you go and look in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see Fabian Parkway. This goes through an industrial park area. And you can see that there's several large ponds there. Parking for some of these ponds is problematic, but if you can park on the road, these ponds get very little human traffic. And as a result, I think they attract a lot of birds. I've seen large uh, numbers of herons of all kinds, including black crowned night herons and uh, well, especially green herons there. Uh, common gallinule breed in a couple of these ponds uh, off and on. And it's a great spot to go to. It's also, I think, going back to what I said about Lambert Lake, something I think we need to do, maybe do a little bit more of, and that's monitor 
these kind of unprotected places because I think they are overlooked and they do offer some rich, rich habitat, not just for birds, but for all kinds of uh, animals. There's a couple of forest preserves here that are worth visiting. Mallard Lake for one, it's very close to Stratford Square. The first time I went there, I'm afraid I broke the law a lot. And I don't remember what the years were, but most of the site uh, had no trespassing signs around it. Most all the area that you see surrounding the park was farmland and uh, Hawk Hollow didn't exist. But I, wa I went to Mallard Lake, it has some great trails. Do be aware it's highly, uh, I, I call it recreation lake. A lot of fishing going on there, a lot of people on bicycles, <coughs> but the birds are there too. And yeah, nothing too exciting perhaps, but the brown-headed cowbird was the first one I saw last spring, was able to photograph. And a bird that I, I don't see in, Florida, supposed to be along the beach. I haven't seen it yet. Caspian terns. I've seen its smaller cousin, the royal tern, a lot, but it was always good to see a Caspian. Well, one day I decided to visit St. James Farm. Again, this, this is very different from the St. James Farm I started going to. And uh, it's very well developed, very nice trails, saw a few birds. But the bird that really surprised me and why I like to tell people, you know, birds don't read books, they have wings. I looked up and there were migrating white pelicans. Uh, always a thrill to see those. Some of you know that if you go to uh, Nelson Lake March in Kane County, they're often seen there. I've led bird walks where we've seen lone migrating pelicans even in June, but this is quite a large flock. And there were Eastern Phoebes all over the place. I'm going to tell the beginners at the library that if they see a bird like this and they can't identify it, I always remember Bob Fisher's words to little, little grasshopper when he said, the difference between an expert and a beginner is that an expert's misidentified more birds than a beginner. But white crowned sparrows, were at St. James Farm, quite a few of them the day I visited. Black and white warblers were there. And of course the Eastern bluebirds were already nesting. And I think a lot of beginners really would like to see these birds. They are, they are great. Another uh, place I like to bird, and I don't know if it gets a lot of attention, is Hidden Lake Forest Preserve, just south of Butterfield. I actually started going to Hidden Lake when I was doing a project involving reptiles and amphibians for the Forest Preserve District. But I discovered that, first of all, there's lots and lots of birds there, uh, especially during the breeding season. I like to call it the poor man's Morton Arboretum. You don't have to pay to get in. It abuts the Arboretum. Uh, a lot of the birds you'll see at the Arboretum, you'll eventually see at Hidden Lake. From the purposes of my 100 bird project, the bird that really uh, helped it along was Eastern Kingbirds. They, we were there, there was about 12 of them. And Indigo Bunting, although this one didn't quite cooperate photographically, but uh, it's a good bird to point out to beginners. Of course, across the water, green heron. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm gonna remind people, don't forget your own yard. Uh, I had house finches. They're always a nice bird to have show up. And gold finches. And you, you know, like showing beginners this one because it's uh, actually, it's one of the first birds well, when I came back a few weeks, a week ago from Florida, uh, my bird feeders were empty. Uh, my sons couldn't figure out how to open up a bird feeder and put seed in it apparently. Uh, so I restocked the bird feeders and 
two days later, the goldfinches were back. And of course, robins in the yard are always good. My house sparrows came back and by the end, middle end of May, uh, as you can see with this young one with the yellow on its uh, mandibles there, uh, they'd already nested, bred, ready to start another brood. The hummingbirds were back. Since this was originally uh, intended to be uh, a presentation for the Woodridge Library, I wanted to talk about, I want to talk to them about some of the places they have access to relatively close. I'm in Glen Ellen, so Central DuPage preserves are, are my stomping ground. You know, I can get what, maybe at half a dozen within 15 or 20 minutes. But you go up to the north, I'm sorry, the upper left-hand corner, there's Eggerman Woods. Uh, there's still no parking there. I, I found it kind of a hard to, place to get into the last time I was there, but it was a woodland. I saw uh, a couple great horned owls and uh, heard some of the birds. Bob was talking about things like a wood thrush and uh, possibly a very great crested flycatcher. It's kind of, it's worth, it's worth the effort to get inside. And in the lower right-hand corner is Oldfield Oaks Forest Preserve. Another one that I kind of stumbled on and had excellent trails, diverse habitat. Uh, you could probably walk it in an hour or less and expose yourself to open grassland, marshes, woodland. It had one of the greatest wildflower displays I've ever seen in the forest preserve. I don't wanna forget Green Valley Forest Preserve. Uh, many, many trails there. That Little Blue Lake showing up by Route 53 and 83rd Street, of course, is the, uh, I'm trying to think what Mike Madsen calls it, the fuddle. Uh, not easy to get to, but uh, we've seen avocets there and stilts and uh, all kinds of shorebirds in August. In the springtime, well, quite honestly, I haven't visited in the springtime, but I imagine there's a lot of great things to be seen there too. Bob was talking a lot about the data and I, I really think we need to emphasize this with beginning birders. Their notebooks and their data, it's all important. Most of us are familiar with eBird, uh, sponsored by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. I think for beginners, if you don't know this site, become familiar with it. You can find out, for example, if you wanna learn about the great egret or any other bird, you type in the bird's name, you can see photographs, you can listen to them. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, resource. Of course, I'm seeing in this picture, I love it because there's the eager with the alligator. One of these days, I'll tell you about the alligators uh, that I encounter in Florida, but I ha still have both legs and all my fingers. So it's not as scary as some people might think. Uh, eBird is a great place too to find out about different forest pr preserves. Here I mentioned. Eggerman's Woods. And lo and behold, I'm looking at the last person. I just got this today. Look who the last person is who bird it there, her own Vita Kalina. And uh, she had a pretty good day at this preserve. And then I wanted to look at Oldfield Oaks. Oh, Vicki, you showed up. You had a good day too, it looks like. Look at all those woodpeckers. Um, but these are the kinds of resources that we need to tell people about. I mean, as small as Oldfield Oaks is, 145 species of birds have been observed there. That's, that's remarkable. Now, a lot of you know about eBird, like I said, 
Do you know about iNaturalist? This is perhaps my new favorite website. It's not just for birds. Uh, it's for any, any plant or animal, really. I, uh, I've started taking photographs of things. You can post them and you, they have algorithms that are pretty, pretty accurate. I think 98% of the time, uh, but the algorithm identifies the plant or animal at, in my experience, as in my experience, is what it is. And plus there are people these, whom they call identifiers who uh, will look at what you have and uh, if they disagree, they'll say so and say why. Scientists all over the world are using the data collected here. This is a, a great egret that I happen to have photographed on Marco Island in Florida. Uh, I really had to beat the bushes to find it. I was sitting at a bar in Marco Island having a, a sandwich and uh, this bird was on the dock about 15 feet away, but uh, you know, that you can get a lot of information about the birds here. And you do have to register, but I think it's a resource we need to let people know about. Finally, I'm gonna encourage people, uh, the beginners, that there are a lot of places to get information. The Page Birding Club is a great place. Um, both uh, our website and we have a Facebook page. I try to share things there, uh, both generated by club members and by groups like Suburban Wildlife, Illinois Birding Network, Chicago Ornithological Society. If I find something, if something is shared with me that I think of, is of interest to uh, birders, I'll put it on the club's page. I have my own Facebook page. I call it John's Natural the Page. Uh, a little broader, not quite bird centric, but uh, it has a lot of the information that I uh, of interest to birders. Of course, there's ebird.org and inaturalist.org. What I hope people understand is that the Page County has these great, great birding opportunities and they shouldn't be overlooked. We shouldn't, you know, look down on them because we don't have roseate spoonbills or flamingos or something like that flying around. So, so I guess that's all I have to say tonight. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate uh, people coming and uh, listening and watching all this. All right, uh, oh, Natalie. I'm coming. Natalie's going to say she enjoyed it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Thank you, John, for that. That was really good. Um, I think it's really nice to remember how much we have around us and how uh, accessible a lot of these birds are. You just got to get out there with your field guide, <laughs> or I do have to use the field guide, and uh, look for them. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They're there. Yeah. Well, thanks for tying it with your Florida life and... Uh, thinking so highly of uh, your Illinois and Midwestern roots. So that's great. You know, corn, there's a place for corn and I love it. <laughs> corn and pork. Yeah, the birds seem to like the seeds we have here too. So, right. and the worms, et cetera. So, well, I guess that's about it folks. Is there any, if there's any questions you can type, uh, we have a couple minutes, you can uh, type them into the chat or whatever. Um, otherwise you're free to go birding, uh, listening for owls or whatever, if you'd like, or go to bed early and wake up and get out there tomorrow, rain or shine, I guess maybe rain. But, uh, I, I have a question, where's Oldfield birding, John? Uh, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to look at the map, Gene. Um, it's north, it's north of, yeah, it's closer to Bob. It's north of um, uh, Waterfall Glen. No, Bob, it's, you, was that Bob talking? It's on the other side of the Stevenson. It's at uh, Lamont Road and uh, Boughton Road 
just east of that corner. Uh, it's on a little street called Old Field Road. Yeah, yeah, you have to kind of go into the neighborhood to get to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, somebody put the Google map there for you in the chat. Yeah, and I'll take you right there, Gene. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, like I said, this has all been recorded, so we will um, look for this on YouTube. You can review the maps and all the different things have been thrown out here this evening. And don't forget our surrounding counties too. Lots of great birding there too. So. Yeah. <laughs> And I think there's a lot of information on the, the web page um, at the hotspots. You can go a lot of the places that John talked about are, are mentioned on the hotspot too, with information about birding those areas. That's a good resource, especially yep. this time of year. Yeah, the, the birding do page section of our website has um, some great, there's a checklist of all the birds do page. There's hotspot profiles for more information on many places that John just couldn't get to. He had so many other ones to share. So um, yeah. I encourage everyone to poke around our website, of course, and our YouTube page. So.